Okay, so uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is Jan and I will be uh, discussing part of my PhD project today and it's about waves in oscillatory media. Um, first, I want to uh, tell you something about oscillations and more specifically about oscillations in biology because they are everywhere. So there are a lot of periodic phenomena all around us. So um, for example, I assume that most of us wake up and go to sleep uh, once every 24 hours. So this is regulated by our circadian clock, uh, which is tuned to the day and night cycles. We have heartbeats, very regular usually. We have cell division cycles, for example, where cells divide in two, four, eight, and so on. Uh, cells also exhibit metabolic oscillations, for example. And there are many, many more examples of this periodic behavior. On a cellular level, such oscillations are often generated by uh, the interplay of different molecules, proteins, genes, and so on. And we can look at these um, as an interaction network of lots of different um, molecules and proteins and so on. And these reaction networks, they can be studied as dynamical systems using, for example, ODEs for the concentrations of all these molecules, proteins. And usually an oscillation periodic behavior is a stable limit cycle of such um, a reaction network. So I want to discuss two particular network motives, as they are called, that are often found in such uh, reaction networks that underlie oscillations. So there are, there are more uh, different kind of uh, motives, sorry. Uh, that can produce oscillations. So the paper I put here as a reference from the bottom by Novak and Tyson is a classic reference for that. Um, I want to highlight two motives that often generate oscillations because they will come back later in my presentation. So the first one is a positive and a negative feedback together. So first of all, you need a negative feedback in a system for it to oscillate because you need to have something that pushes the system back to its initial state, basically, that resets it to get the oscillation to, to restart it, basically. Now, if you have just a negative feedback in the system, it often ends up in uh, a stable state because, well, you have the negative feedback, and if, you, if the system strays away from the steady state, well, the negative feedback immediately acts to push it back. However, if you combine a negative feedback with, for example, an additional positive feedback, the system is pushed away from a steady state and then can lead, this can lead to oscillations. I have a very like a, an abstract cartoon of what, what such an oscillation uh, can look like. So usually if you have this positive feedback, this creates an underlying bistable system like the S-shaped curve on the bottom left here. And the system oscillates by going around this bistable curve by jumping between the two branches and then uh, proceeding along them. So, this is often found in biochemical oscillations, for example. A second motive, again, has a negative feedback, but now there's a time delay involved, and this is found, for example, in many genetic oscillators. So here, the idea is that this uh, negative feedback does not immediately push back the system to steady state, but the system only realizes that it has, has to have this negative feedback after a little time delay. So basically, the system periodically over and undershoots its steady state and this causes the system to oscillate, which I show very schematically here on the bottom right. So the system goes around some kind of curve, but well, the, the main idea is that the delay causes the system to overshoot regularly, periodically, its steady state. Okay, I will come back to these things a bit later, but I wanted to show them here already because they're related to these network motives. Now, next, what if you a couple oscillations in space, for example, we have um, diffusion of these molecules and uh, at different locations you have this oscillatory behavior. I will so show you a, mu a movie which you maybe probably have already seen before. So this is a chemical reaction called the belousov sabatinsky reaction, uh, classic in nonlinear dynamics. It's a chemical system, not a biochemical system, but it exhibits these very nice patterns when you uh, put a chemical reaction in a dish. So you can see here that the system is oscillating at the different locations. And you see that the oscillations coupled in space, they generate waves. And you can also see that these waves, they seem to come from somewhere usually. So here on the top right, there is a, like a center and you have concentric waves coming out of it. Here in the middle, you have two nice spirals and so on. A second example is from biology. 
So I, I took this from a recent paper um, in cell. What you can see here, so the medium, so things in space are actually cells. And every cell, what you see in color is a fluorescent marker for a certain protein. And these cells, they exhibit what is called uh, the segmentation clock, which is uh, a biological system that generates what that leads to the vertebrae. So it's uh, something in development. Okay, so you also see here that the waves and oscillations, they seem to originate from somewhere. And then you have these outgoing waves. A third example is from our own lab. So perhaps you've seen my colleague Felix's presentation on Monday. So this is similar to what he said. In our lab, we studied the cell cycle. What you can see here is a cell. So it's a, a frog egg and it divides regularly. So where's the oscillation? Well, each cell division is accompanied by uh, periodically uh, protein activities going up and down. So we have a lot of proteins produced, created and so on. And every cycle, well, you get a cell division. Now, my colleagues from the lab, they can do some magic and they can turn these frog eggs into what is called a cell-free extract. What's the cell-free extract? Well, it's basically all of the biochemistry without structure, so you don't have membranes and things like that. This cell-free extract, you can do a lot of things with them. And one of the things you can do is you can put in a tube, and this is the result. So you can see this cell-free extract in a tube. It is, still has oscillations, as you can see here. And they also seem to come from somewhere. So you have this region that seems to be sending out waves. Okay, I'll show it again. So this is a well, quasi 1D system. And you can see that, uh, well, it oscillates and there are waves here. So this is a third example I wanted to show you. Now, for the rest of my talk, I want to um, discuss a question about these waves. So often the waves are like, they come from somewhere. Often this is uh, the origin pacemaker regions. Uh, in biological systems, these waves, they can have a function, for example, to transmit information. So a natural question is, well, what determines the speed of these waves? Now, and this is a question I will address in the rest of the talk. I will uh, switch gears and be, it will be a little bit more, um, well, modeling and, and a bit more physics -y from now on. So this is the situation I'm going to um, mention the results. So this is the system we study. So we have a one dimensional, uh, one dimension in space system. Uh, at every location, we have an oscillation. Yeah? So it, it oscillates everywhere, but in the middle, you have a region which oscillates slightly faster. This is the pacemaker region. Okay, after a while, you will see that this pacemaker region starts sending out waves. And there are two wave speeds that we are interested in here. So the red line is the wave speed. So this is if you would, for example, on a movie track like a peak of fluorescence, this is the speed at which it would move. So that's the wave speed itself. But then there's a second speed, the blue line, which we call the envelope speed. So um, what basically happens is that in the beginning, uh, you have on the outside of the pacemaker region, you also have an oscillation. The pacemaker starts sending out waves, but every period, like the outside oscillation catches up with the wave and it's annihilated. So only more slowly does the wave permeate the whole medium. And we're also interested in, well, what determines the speed uh, by which these uh, waves spread into the medium. Okay. So more uh, specific, how do the speeds depend on the mechanism of oscillation related to the things I discussed in the beginning? The size and the frequency of the pacemaker region itself. Maybe the shape of the limit cycle has something to do with it if you have a more harmonic kind of oscillator or if you have your more kind of relaxation uh, type oscillator with sharp jumps. And then the usual suspect is the diffusion strength because if you have a larger diffusion of molecules, you might expect that well, these waves will probably go faster. Okay, I would like to mention some previous work because this pacemaker uh, problem is, is not at all new and uh, there have been a lot of studies uh, more, uh, more related to the, the chemical systems, such as the, the Belousov-Sapatinsky reaction. 
However, most of the theoretical results, they're reasonably old, like so the, the, well, the main references from the, the 80s and the late 70s, even some of them, and they uh, quite often deal with a limit case. For example, the complex ginsburg landau equation, uh, oscillations close to half bifurcation, or the other uh, kind of limit in extreme time scale separation, where you have these very sharp uh, wave trains, like in that Tyson and Keener's review paper, if you know that. So what we want to do here is go a little bit beyond that and more quantitatively study, well, what is the effect of all the different parameters on the wave speed and the envelope speed? So let's go back to these two motives that can generate oscillations in the beginning. These are the two models, mathematical models, I use to study these questions I mentioned. So the first one uh, is based on this negative positive feedback loop. And this is a variant of the Van der Poel oscillator that I study. Um, so we have a system with a cubic null cline and, and, and the, the oscillation is basically going around these branches and jumping between the branches. So uh, that's what happens here. So this is, uh, I will also refer to this oscillator as the bistable oscillator. It's not bistable in itself. You just have the limit cycle. But if you would fix the V variable, then the U would go to two, one of two stable uh, branches. So I'll refer to this as a bistable oscillator. And the second oscillator is um, uh, this one, the time delayed negative feedback loop. So here we have also the, the, um, the same kind of system. So we have uh, also something similar to the cubic knot line, but we cut off the branches basically. We cut off the branches of the cubic knot line and, um, and the, the system behaves very similarly, but it doesn't follow the branches, but it overshoots. So the system basically goes around, but overshoots hmm, the branch. The equations are the following. So uh, if, if you uh, recognize this, it's not really that important. There is an important parameter here, epsilon, which denotes the time scale separation between the two variables. So u is fast variable, and this epsilon denotes how fast do you jump between those two branches. And the parameter is also present in the delayed system. Um, I designed the delayed system to be as close as possible to the bistable system. So uh, mathematically, they're different. The right is a delay equation, the left is just an ordinary differential equation. But to try to compare them anyway, so we designed the delayed system to be as close as possible to the left system. So, first of all, depending on the epsilon parameter, the shape of these oscillations is very, uh, very different. On the top row, epsilon is very small. Large time scale separation, you have this um, relaxation kind of oscillations with the sharp jumps, and the behavior is similar for the bistable and the delayed oscillator. If epsilon is larger, both systems are more harmonic like and the, the waveforms are more like a sine wave. And also in the phase plane, they, they are like nearly circular. So this is like the, a weakly nonlinear limit, let's say. And for both bistable and the delayed system, this is similar. This epsilon parameter will be the main parameter, by the way, that I will, I will study. Okay, so let's go to the results now, maybe finally. So, what happens if you couple these systems in space? What, uh, what are the waves like that they send out? So first of all, an observation is that they do not necessarily propagate linearly outwards into the medium. Here you can see two space-time plots. On the top, we have a straight line, like the envelope, the black line is straight. The influence of the pacemaker propagates linearly outwards. On the bottom plot, it's more like a, like a square rootish, so it's, it's much slower somehow. And this also, this depends on this epsilon parameter. So he, we fitted an, uh, a curve to this outgoing envelope. And this is the, the exponent you get here. So one is linear and lower than one is this sublinear spreading. And you see that for low epsilon, it's linear. It's even a little bit higher than one here. And then it goes down if epsilon is too large. So in this sense, having a large separation of time scale enhances the, the wave speed. Uh, sorry, the, the propagation of waves. Also the wave speed, so that's probably my next slide. Yeah, here it is. So uh, where we have these outgoing waves, we can track the speed as a function of this epsilon parameter. So keep in mind, um, 
the red and the blue line have similar waveforms. On the left, relaxation lag. On the right, sinusoidal. But the speed dependence on this epsilon parameter is different for both systems. So for the bistable system, the speed goes down as epsilon goes up. So sinusoidal kind of waveforms, slower waves. That's what this means. OK, now I want to uh, go back a little bit to this literature I mentioned on, on, the, on, the, on the previous work slide and uh, want to compare with some of the, the classic, classic approaches. So what you can do is you can make um, approximations of the system to get an approximation of the wave speed. We uh, performed two of these approximation methods. So the first one is the singular perturbation method, or limit of low epsilon, where you look at the wave trains as fronts, traveling fronts back to back, and they form the wave trains. The second approximation, sorry, uh, is a, what is called a phase approximation. So this is also uh, elaborated by Kuramoto in his book, for example. And here you say, oh, let's forget about the details of the limit cycle, about U and V variables. We only look at the phase. So how far along is the oscillator on its limit cycle? And then this phase depends on the space and time. Uh, it follows this equation. And here the alpha and the beta parameters, they can be derived from the original system from the limit cycle, and they determine the speed. Okay. What's the result? Well. Here you can see it. The dashed line singular perturbation works only for the bistable oscillator, so the van der Poel variant, and gives a good approximation for low epsilon as expected. Maybe uh, also very interesting is the phase reduction method, which you can do for both systems. And this works well if epsilon is higher, so in the more harmonic regime. And uh, quite unexpected, it works well for the delayed system over the whole range, so even if this oscillation looks like it's a relaxation kind of oscillator all well, this this works well for the for the delayed system and not well for the bistable system and there appear to be like two regimes somehow this wave speed follows and here actually for higher values of epsilon everything is just more or less the same okay let's go to the envelope speed uh, maybe you've been wondering what's that about so the envelope speed that was the blue line in this plot on the top right, and it's actually related to the, the wave speed. So uh, we can derive a geometric formula for this um, envelope speed. So envelope speed is capital C, wave speed is small c in this formula here. Uh, if the wave speed goes up, then the envelope speed goes up. So faster waves, faster permeation into the medium. However, there is a second factor which de depends on the period difference between the pacemaker and the outside medium. It does not depend on the intrinsic period of the pacemaker, but somehow on, on this PT, the effective period of the pacemaker. Let's look at this diagram on the bottom right. So wh what do I mean? So here we have PO, period of the outside medium, PI, which is the intrinsic frequency of the pacemaker. But then if you switch on the spatial coupling and diffusion, the pacemaker region will shift up its period towards the outside medium. It's influenced by the outside, for example, through diffusion. Okay? And it's this difference that determines what the relation is between the envelope speed and the wave speed. So, uh, and the shift, so the shift is purple line. This depends on the diffusion, but also on the size of the pacemaker, for example. Okay, so these factors, they determine how the envelope speed changes. I will give one example, which is with, uh, and this is also the last example, uh, uh, which is the, the, how the size of the pacemaker influences the speeds. So here I have a simulation for a small pacemaker on top and a larger pacemaker on the bottom. The wave speed is not so clear to see, but you can see that the envelope speed for the bottom one is higher because uh, the waves, they reach the boundary sooner than, than what would happen in the top plot. And that's not just because they start closer to the boundary. So they, they, the speed of the envelope is actually higher in the bottom plot. However, the wave speed is slower. So this is slightly counterintuitive. So if you have a larger pacemaker, the waves it sends out are slower, but they will permeate faster into the medium. And here are two curves uh, that show this. So if uh, so, it actually this, it, uh, they go to a constant value for very large pacemakers, where they don't suffer any influence from the outside. So that's 
it's really this effective period that determines how, how the envelope and the wave speed are related. Okay, so this is everything I think I wanted to say. Let's conclude. So I uh, discussed two different mechanisms that generate oscillations, time delay, and the other bistable, uh, based on a bistable system. Um, so we had also different approximation methods. They work well in different regimes for the wave speed. Um, and then in the end, I uh, wanted to show you something about how the size, for example, and some geometric properties of the pacemaker can determine the envelope speed and the wave speed. So an outlook, um, what, what's next? Well, uh, it would be very interesting to see if we can test some of these uh, things experimentally, for example, in the cell-free extracts by controlling location, size, frequency of pacemakers there. Uh, the second point is something which we already did actually, it's published a few months ago, um, which is what does happen if you have multiple pacemakers in the same medium and they compete, who wins? Then third, well, I, I showed you that you can approximate the speed in two regimes, but I am wondering what, is there any way of doing an approximation in the middle? I, I, I don't know, um, maybe there is. So that would also be interesting to see. And then what, well, can generalize it, see what happens in 2D. And maybe for excitable systems, because many of these real biological and chemical systems are, can be excitable and not necessarily oscillatory. Um, I mentioned the, the results will be close to what, what we found for small epsilon in the, like the Van der Poel oscillator. So thank you for your attention. Here are some references which might be of interest um, if you have any questions.